Um, yeah, so, so as Rick mentioned, there have been quite a few people working on this, and, and I think the project has probably gone over about uh, 18 months to two years, I think. Um, I, I came in um, at about Chapter 5, I think, of, of about 22. Um, so, look, uh, for some background, and a lot of you will have seen this, this diagram that um, I, think, I think Rick must have put together, and what, what it is essentially showing is... Um, time along along this axis, of course. So from 1954 through to through to 2014, um, and this is the exploration activity and the discovery of, of deposits in, in northwest uh, Queensland. Um, and and the points, I guess, the point it's making is that um, this is this is these are your deposits being discovered, and and you're starting to go a little bit deeper. No, nowhere near the depths that um, that the deposits are being found at elsewhere. Uh, this is 200 metres here, but you can generally see that those deposits are starting to get get deeper with time. So it's becoming a becoming a harder search. Now the other the other key point is is this is the um, this this is I guess our, our our research plot up here and so you can see there were university studies um, GSQ mapping and GA etc the various uh, cooperative research centers that happened and and various other um, research programs um, and uh, a lot of them happened after 1994, after there was a rash of discoveries, which is, is natural. Um, you know, there, there are discoveries and, and, and it immediately prompts um, people's attention in, in areas. Um, but what, what hasn't happened, and, and here it says up the top, research does not equal discoveries. So, so the, the question is then, how, how are we going to better be able to take all of that research and convert it in, into discoveries? Um, and and one, one of the ways to do that is, is to actually look at that information and there's, there's an absolute truckload of it about northwest Queensland out there and try and synthesise what are the key things that, um, that people need, need to know. Mapping equals discovery. Sorry? Mapping equals, mapping equals discovery. Well, mapping equals discoveries, yeah. Well, it, it may not have equaled the Jericho discovery, I'm afraid, but, um, but, but at least they've been made. So um, I, I guess the, the, the approach, and I guess it was set up, set up by Rick, Rick and, and Helen, was to, to say, well, let's, let's make that, that material um, available to everybody um, and, and not only summarising as, as would happen in, in a book, you know, the, the book, Northwest Queensland Mineral Deposits, but to do more than that and to actually take, take the data as well. So, so the atlas, and I'm sure probably everybody here is reasonably familiar with it, comprises, um, comprises two components. One is, is essentially, I say hard copy, but it's a PDF uh, document that summarises each, uh, each deposit. And the other is the digital data compilation, which comes in two parts. One, um, the, the raw data that we've, we've used, which has been provided, I, I should say, by so, so many companies have been very generous and, and other entities, organisations, very generous with their data and their time. Um, so we've put that together. Uh, so the raw data is there. And then uh, we've also um, put all of that into, into some software called Geoscience Analyst, which is a freely available sort of 3D platform. Um, so, so that's the Atlas, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So in summary, there were 28 um, deposits, of which, which five really are truly world class, and we'll get onto them in a minute. The discovery history, if you look at it, has been sort of 1882 um, to 2006 uh, for those deposits. This is the deposits in the Atlas. Um, and you look at the range of metals um, that, you know, I think when, when you look at that, copper, copper, gold, lead, zinc, silver, moly, uranium, gold, uranium, phosphate, you really realise how truly impressive northwest Queensland is. You know, it's, it's and, and, you know, you, you, you try, and, try and think about it and say, what, what other terrains around the world do you, do you get that range of, of, of commodities and mineral deposit types and, and world-class deposits, and, and they're pretty few and, um, and far between. So Northwest Queensland is, is really, really special. Um, so, so the data sources, as I mentioned, project owners have, have given us a, a lot of data, historic research through all the theses and collaborative research projects, et cetera. Um, the public materials, there are so many monograph volumes and presentations. Uh, we've, we've gained a lot of information from stock exchange releases from some of the um, smaller companies who release the information because it's material to them. Uh, the government databases, of course, the GSQ, Geoscience Australia, 
well, QDEX, that's ob obsolete now. It's been replaced by the Geoscience Data Portal and, and, and OSGIN that, that has the, um, you know, all the high logger data throughout the, out the terrain in it. So um, a lot of data out there and we've, we've really um, fished sort of hard, hard and long. So the, the, the basis of, of, I guess, the, the atlases and, and um, there's 22 chapters is, is for each, each deposit, we've gone through and put the regional data sets together in, in what we hope is, is a very consistent way. So that we've, we've taken areas surrounding the deposits, for example, about 40 kilometres by 25 kilometres, and then tried try to, try to take that approach, I guess, of, of an atlas where, where you can sit it, put, put it on your coffee table and, and flick through and see all those different, um, different representations as, as you traditionally see in an atlas that you pull out for your kids, et cetera. And, and those data sets, you can see some of them there. They range from the geophysics and the geochemistry and the geology and the airborne hyperspectral data and, and, and all these things that are available in northwest Queensland. So we put them together um, to, to view the data sets in a consistent spatial context. So you know how all of those data sets relate to each other at the same scale and over the same area. Um, and then we, we've, we've put text in there as well, but the focus has really been on, on, on the maps and, and diagrams and cross sections, et cetera, and, and, and plots of geochemical data, et cetera, because really it's, it's, it's so much nicer to absorb your information um, graphically rather than, than reading a whole bunch of text. But having said that, there, there is, is a lot of text and it's reasonably well referenced. Um, so, so that's, um, that's the, the regional data sets. And then we've, we've gone down to the deposit scale data sets. And, and I guess the objective is, was certainly in, in, in my mind was to say, you, you, you read papers, for example, and they'll say, we, we've gone to this deposit, we've done this work, we've, we've used this high power analytical technique or this geophysics, we've logged down a borehole and here's the plot from it, et cetera. But you, you, you don't often really get that spatial sense of, well, actually, where is that data in the deposit? or around the deposit? And, and is, is there actually any trend within that data that you should be aware of? Um, you know, is it, are you gonna be able to understand what your fluid pathways were? Because you need to have that data in, in, in consistent spatial space so that you, you can then see those trends and how they're operating in 3D. So that, that was sort of the, the objective. And then I, I guess putting that in, in, into words in one phrase, it was really to map out the halo characteristics because we're, deposits, uh, they're not being found so much and people are going undercover. And, and if you're drilling through 500 metres or 600 metres of cover, as for example, is, is happening around, around Northwest Queensland now, and it's been happening, I guess, for a lot longer in, in places like around Olympic Dam on the Stewart Shelf, you don't get too many shots at, um, at, at data collection. So that, so that if you put an 800 metre hole in, you, you you know, you probably, no matter what sort of targeting you've got, it's very rare to hit the guts of a, of a mineralised system. So that you, you need to understand where your hole sits in that broader system. So, so the aim has been to document those, those halos, geochemical and, and, and geophysical and, and particularly alteration wise and, and, and texturally as well, I guess, in terms of breaches and structures is, is in, in that deposit, where, where, is your, where is your hole going down in, in that system? So that, um, you know, with one hole, you can't vector, but you can at least know maybe where you might be in the system. So that's, that's really been one of the overarching goals. So at the deposit scale, the basic data, and, and we, we've had a lot of this provided by, by property owners, project owners, um, the geological sections, um, also, even fault surfaces and geometries or, or, or lenses, for example, this is a plot of um, Osborne and Chernova kindly supplied those, um, those or, or surfaces, etc. Um, so, so 3D surfaces, cross sections and maps and even, even drilling databases. So, so I guess we've liaised a lot with project owners and some of them have been so generous, um, for example, to supply their entire drilling database on, on the understanding, obviously, that we don't, we don't put that all out um, publicly, but that we can then select um, representative holes from that database um, to, to put out there. Um, so, so they're all the sort of basic data that we, we, we all have around our, our projects and deposits. Um, and then we've also tried to include the specialised data um, that, that is, is, is fortunately becoming a bit more common now. Things like high logger, um, TEMA and, and, and petrophysical data that CIRO collected in their Uncover, Uncover um, Cloncurry project. 
and, and the sort of stuff that you find in theses, you know, isotope data, geochronology, et cetera. So, so we're basically taking that basic data that we all have as explorationists uh, or, or mine geologists around a deposit and putting it together with that more specialist data that other organisations are connecting, collecting. Okay, now this is, this is a list of the um, deposits. I'm, I'm not going to go into detail today about, about too many of the broad themes and conclusions from, from the Atlas, but one thing that was, is pretty quick to do and easy is to sit down and, and have a look at the, I guess, the discovery history and methods in, uh, in northwest Queensland. Um, so we'll have a look at that and see what conclusions we can draw, and then we'll, we'll, we'll just have a bit of a look at some of the, the signatures and halos that we've been documenting from some of the deposits as well. Um, so, so this is the this is the list of deposits in um, in in the atlas, uh, and I've clustered it by um, date of discovery. Um, you know, date of discovery is always somewhat subjective. Um, you know, thing, things get noted, but but um, you know, is it is it when Gossens were first noticed, or or was it when the first drill hole was drilled, or or actually things sit around for twenty years and then then actually a resource is defined? Is it then, etc. But in, in general, this is, is a plot of those um, date and method of discovery. So I guess the, the first thing is, is to note the method of discovery. And, and it's not surprising that um, as you look through that method of discovery, prospecting, prospecting, drilling, prospecting, prospecting, drilling, prospecting, prospecting, drilling, prospecting, 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 drilling, prospecting, prospecting, uh, geological mapping, rock chip sampling, soil geochemistry, prospecting, okay? And that's Pegmont is the last prospecting in 1970. So essentially prior to 1970, most of those discoveries more or less were based on prospecting, seeing old workings, um, gossens, you know, malachite in outcrop, etc., and or drilling around old timers pits, okay? So that was until 1970. And then after 1970, I guess it, it became more a technological um, discovery path. So that you see, then you started to look at ground EM, aeromagnetic, um, stream sediment geochemistry, soil geochemistry, and there's quite a few aeromag, um, and then there's air core drilling and prospecting drilling uh, on the end there, okay? So, so I, I guess it's not surprising that about 1970, um, the discovery method started to be something that was a bit more technologically and, and, and I guess, systematically based rather, rather than um, prospecting. Um, now, the other, the other thing I've highlighted here, here in purple what, and, and this is subjective as well, but what I would consider to be the truly world-class deposits. And so there, there was that first obvious phase of, of Mount Isa Copper and, and uh, Lead Zinc Silver, uh, arguably, you could put Mount Isa Copper a lot later than that because I don't think it came into production until about the 1950s or something, maybe. But it, it was essentially sort of Gossens, et cetera, were seen in those early days. So you had those two, two world-class discoveries in 25 and uh, 23, I think, is it? Um, and then, uh, and this is, the, this is the stunning point, I think, from this plot, Century, Cannington and Ernest Henry all were discovered in basically those, those two years. Okay, and uh, Canning a century was was, uh, and, and and this is from my reading of the data was essentially a soil geochemistry discovery, but Cannington and um, and Ernest Henry were both from those big um, aeromagnetic surveys uh, that were flown at, at various times, so it's 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 I think it's re really interesting that that these discoveries the first two cluster and um, I mean they're they're right next door to each other so um, so it's not a surprise. Uh, and then the, the following three, they're, they're, you know, in such, such geographically spaced in such different places and, and three different types of ore deposits, um, but they were both discovered in that, in that rash of, of 1990, 1991, which when you step back and that plot that we put up earlier that showed the discoveries and then the start of the research, a lot of that intensive research started in, in 19, about 1990, 1991 uh, on the back of these, these discoveries. So, so it's you know it's 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 a really interesting uh, interesting uh, look at it, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing that next uh, world class discovery, maybe 2021, on the end of that diagram. Um, 
Yeah, so, so this is just to highlight, there was that nine-year year period when, when there were um, so many discoveries in, the, in that one, uh, one period. So the, the, the other thing that's interesting when, when you, you, you survey all of these deposits and, and you look at, at how they were targeted, okay, and that there are a couple that really stand out for their conceptual targeting, okay? Um, I think it might be on the next slide. But you, you'll see that um, there may have been more than this because, uh, again, what, what's a conceptual target is, is objective as well. Um, but essentially, you go, in 1966, the Eastern Georgina Basin was targeted as a, as a favourable location on, um, on the basis of, of analysis of the sedimentary environments. And um, Matt was showing that diagram a little bit earlier and, and saying, well, most of the Georgina Basin actually sits in the Northern Territory. But if, if you look at the Georgina Basin, all of the, of the, the high-grade phosphates are on the eastern margin sitting, sitting here in Queensland. And, and that, that was nominated back in 1966 as a favourable place to explore for phosphate deposit, economic phosphate deposits. And the, the really interesting thing is if you look back at that history, okay, um, all of those deposits and, and that, that Matt showed, there were probably about eight of them, were all found within about two or three years. So as, as soon as people came in and decided this was the place to be and they found one phosphate deposit and then they applied that template all the way up the eastern Georgina Basin and, and, and basically found all, all of those deposits that are there now. Uh, yeah, I guess it's, 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 it's a little bit sad that those deposits were all found based on such great work and, and these days Phosphate Hill is the only one that's in, in production sort of 40 years 40, 50, 60 years later. But I'm sure that um, you know, Ardmore is, is probably going to be the next one off the cab off the rank. Um, 1986, Walford Creek. Um, basically, that was um, WMC, seeking sediment hosted stratiform and strata bound type base metal deposits under shallow cover. So that, that was a um, conceptual approach. Um, Tick Hill is a very interesting story. It um, <clears throat> Essentially, what, what, what happened, um, I think it was in, in the 1980s, off, off the back of work by Bill Perkins and others, it, was, it, it, it came, I guess, in, into common thinking that, wow, um, Isaac Copper is, is not actually a, a sin-sedimentary deposit. Um, it, is, it is an epigenetic deposit. Let's go and look for more of them in, um, in, in high-strain zones, um, in, in carbonates, um, and I've forgotten what the other targeting criteria were. And, and that led Carpentaria at that stage to head down south uh, in the Corella Formation. And, um, and uh, we'll, we'll look at it a little bit later, but, but whilst they were searching for Isaac Copper style deposits, they ended up finding the um, incredibly rich Tick Hill Gold deposit. Um, century lead zinc, um, the Lawn Hill area was targeted during a conceptual study seeking base metal deposits. I think that might've been by um, Rio. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, no doubt. And, um, and, and I guess one of the most celebrated stories in terms of um, you know, conceptual scientific targeting is the, is the Cannington Silver Lead Zinc deposit, which was um, BHP. And they, they applied a uh, lithostratigraphic model developed by um, the North New South Wales Geological Survey for Broken Hill. And they came and applied that in, uh, up in northwest Queensland. And then 1991, Ernest Henry Copper Gold, um, where uh, WMC came in and utilised a model based on, on a pull-apart um, or rift basin um, setting with, with various stratigraphy and granites, et cetera. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to have a bit of a look through and see where, which, of those, which of those deposits were, were um, found using um, really conceptual type targeting. And, and I guess it's also interesting now I think about it, you look at it and um, those three world-class deposits found in 1990, 91 were all on the back of that um, conceptual targeting programs. So discovery process, I've just, I've just documented here the discovery tools um, with their number of, um, number of discoveries. And you, you'll see that as, as we saw earlier, prospecting was at the top, um, soil geochemistry, um, and then stream sediment um, geochemistry, um, arguably, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, in, in putting the atlas together, I, I had a good look at um, that fantastic um, document, the Geochemist Toolkit. I, I presume most of you have had a look at it, and, and it was put together by Joe, who's here, and, um, and Lily and Hannah and, and, and one or two others, I think. But it's, it's, it's a fantastic document, and, and it looks at a lot of case studies throughout northwest Queensland. But, but 
it was it was interesting looking at the stream sediment section because um, I don't know if it was it was Keith Hannon's um, impression, but um, it, it, the comment was really made that um, stream sediment geochemistry hadn't really been that successful in terms of um, discovery. Um, so so it, it, dis it discovered two, two deposits. I think in this atlas, if it's Tick Hill is certainly one of them. And I think maybe Grevillea might be the other one that I've, I've ascribed to stream sediment geochemistry. Um, so so that, that was sort of interesting. And then, uh, then you have rock chip geochemistry, air core geochemistry. Um, I think the air core might have might've been Coulthor maybe. And then um, two by ground EM and, and five um, sort of aeromagnetic uh, discoveries. So, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting to actually sit down and put those numbers down on, on paper about, um, about what's, what's been working historically. And obviously it's changed with time. I think, you know, if, if you look at the last 20, 30 years, the prospecting is obviously um, hasn't featured so heavily. So just to, to have a look at some of those halos from typical exploration data sets and, and examples of discoveries from 1969 to 91. So soil geochemistry, century, and um, I'd, if anybody knows more about it, I'd like to be corrected, but, but based on my, my reading of the literature and, and discussions, it, it was essentially a soil geochemistry um, discovery. And, and what you'll see here down on the bottom left uh, are plots um, from um, Agnew 2007, uh, where, where he re reproduced um, the original soil sampling that, that happened um, over the top of century. And it, fr from my understanding, it sounds like the interest was actually in the impact um, crater out to the east. Um, so you, you can see that the northeast on these soil lines uh, was a long line. And just on, on the southwestern end of the line, um, the top is, is zinc ppm in, in minus 180 um, micron soil fraction um, is, that, is that spike over the, over the deposit. So, you know, that, that was 1990, I think. So it's, it's sort of interesting to say, you know, we tend to say the eyes has been explored and everything's been traversed, et cetera. But back in, in 1990, which is not that long ago, there was still a world-class deposit found very close to surface by soil geochemistry. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's quite instructional. Uh, the other stream sediment discovery, Tick Hill Gold deposit. Um, I think I have a plot up here. Um, and and this, this, this is an, an interesting story that um, you'll see, see this one, one point over here. It, um, it, it was part of the, the stream sediment survey uh, on the back of this, this copper program that I was talking about. And, and what you'll see is that um, Carpentaria basically came, came down here and that these are, are rab holes that were drilled on the, on the slightly covered areas. And then off to the north, this, this is sort of, sort of outcropping mainly up through here. And off to the north, it was, was stream sediment sampling. And there was one sample here that returned, uh, you know, seven, seven PPB gold anomaly. And that was followed up upstream until it got to the location um, after a few, few various missteps on the way up. But eventually there was some soil sampling over the top of this area that delineated the, um, the deposit. So, so it, it was a stream sediment um, discovery. Aeromagnetic data, I guess we all know about that. And, um, and, and there's a couple, couple of, of examples here. Obviously, uh, Ernest Henry, you'll see on the left there. And then there's uh, Osborne on the right um, with the, the TMI from, uh, from Osborne. And, and I guess we tend to think of Ernest Henry when we think about magnetic targets in the Eastern Succession. But, but Osborne actually, uh, for the, given the size of the deposit, has a much stronger magnetic um, signal than, uh, than Ernest Henry. And while I'm, while I'm here, this is, the, um, this is the Falcon Airborne Gravity Gradiometry uh, over the deposit as well. Um, what you, you might be able to see is this, is this is the shape of the Osborne ore lenses. So there is actually a, a gravity anomaly uh, in the airborne um, gradiometry sitting over the, over the Osborne deposit as well. So, and, and I guess the thing that I hadn't quite appreciated and that it's worth, worth thinking about is we, we think of IOCG when we think of aeromagnetic data and, and direct, you know, the, the bullseye targeting. But um, you look at, at Cannington has a 1,000 nanotesla um, anomaly. Um, Moronin has a 4,500 nanotesla anomaly. So these silver lead zinc um, systems were actually um, targeted using, using aeromagnetic data as well. So it's, it's not just um, IOCG that we should, should be thinking about in terms of uh, mag data, direct targeting. Obviously there's in, indirect targeting with, with geological interpretation of the mag data, but direct targeting. Um, 
The other one is, is Walford Creek. So this is EM data. Walford Creek, was, it's, it's a really nice discovery history. It was essentially conceptual targeting um, based on, um, you know, there being workings in the area and the right sort of stratigraphy. Uh, it was basically an extension of, of well, let, let's go look for Mount Isa style things. Um, and then it was essentially a ground EM data discovery. So that's interesting. I won't dwell on that too much because we're going to have a good look at it um, a bit later. So, so they're, they're the, the, the real typical deposit, um, deposit signatures in those geophysical and geochemical data sets that, that no doubt we've all seen before. Um, but what I also wanted to, to show you were a couple of other data sets that we've included in the Atlas that, that um, whilst they, they weren't um, directly related to discovery, they uh, are a good characterization of what those deposits look like. And these sorts of technologies, I'm sure, will be aiding in discovery in, in the future. So this is, this is um, the Mount Isa copper and, and, and zinc lead silver deposits. So on, on the left uh, is the RAB and um, diamond drill hole data, um, basically from, from surface. It's, it's been mapped to surface. So, so you'll see that there is the lead, zinc and, uh, and copper there. And, and the thing to note on this is the enormous size of, that, um, of those geochemical halos, okay? At surface, this this is a five kilometre scale bar. So you know you're really looking at, at ten kilometres of, of a long strike anomalism in those uh, in those three base metals. Um, but that's I mean that, that's that's a that's a typical data set. But why why I put this up is this is the sort of sort of new new well I say it's new but it's it's old work by Chris Waring I think in 1990. Um, and and it was this recognition of oxygen isotope depletion over the deposit. So what you'll see is, is these, these higher values up to the north, but as, as you get down to the deposit through here, you, you start to lose, um, or, well, your oxygen isotope, um, uh, you're going, going to, to lighter values. So it's, it's one of those technologies that I guess it's, it's, it's hard to utilise um, sometimes. It's not as easy as taking a portable XRF out into the field, et cetera, but it's, it's one of those sorts of, sorts of um, data sets that it's really worth keeping in, keeping in mind. Another one, and I guess this is becoming more widespread now, particularly on the back of the, um, of the, the GSQ's um, fantastic work in, in putting together their catalogue of, of deposit core and, and high logger data, is the hyperspectral data. And, and I guess it's all also becoming much more common now with, with companies like CoreScan and, and TerraCore as well um, in operation. So um, in, in the Atlas, we've, we've put together where, where it was available, the, uh, the high logger data. Um, because it's, it, it really nicely illustrates the, the mineral alteration uh, halos around, around so many of these deposits. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how many of you have seen it, but, um, and, um, and uh, Ross was talking um, this morning about, um, about the Quem scan, I think it was, and, and not, did I say scan? Quem scan? Um, and Timo is, is a relatively similar technology from CSIRO. And they, they had their under, undercover, um, undercover Cloncurry project. And they, they basically went through so many of those Eastern Succession data um, deposits and, and, and obtained the drill core and samples. And they've, they've done their um, mineralogy um, information, um, the, the Tima scanning. They're, they're little blocks, you know, about a centimetre or two, 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 one and a half to two centimetres. Uh, but, but they really nicely demonstrate the textures and the mineralogies of the ore systems. And what we've done is pull them, pull them into the atlas where they're available and put them down the drill holes where they're sourced from. And in, in this example, you'll also see, I think this is from the high logger line scan imagery as well. So you can actually have a look at that deposit and say, well, this is, this is the mineralogy and textures at this point in space in, in the deposit. So it's, uh, they're, they're the sorts of new, new technologies that are becoming, I guess, a bit more widespread these days. And, and one more that I, I think is, is really interesting, and I wish I had more time to sit down and know more about it, is the um, anisotropic and anisotropic magnetic susceptibility. Um, and this is another um, CSIRO data set that was collected in the Uncover Cloncurry um, project. And I, I, I don't yet fully understand it, but uh, essentially in terms of, of your mineralogy, you, you are, are making your anisotropic magnetic susceptibility based on, on the strain that is, um, is, is happening at the time of your, your magnetite formation. And so, um, you know, Jim Austin has, has some quite, quite interesting 
uh, or well, when you look at his data, which I've plotted up here, so, so this is from, from Ernest Henry with, with his, um, his, his, the directions of his, his magnetic susceptibility. And you can't see it so much on a, on a 2D plot, but, but when you go, go and look at it in detail, you, you really start to see where those, those different orientations are and they're perhaps reflecting um, different, different um, A strain conditions or different generations of magnetite. So it says a, a lot of this really interesting data that's out there that um, is, is starting to become a bit more uh, accessible these days. Um, yeah, so that's it there. Um, look, I've touched on this, um, on this delivery. Uh, so we have the hard copy and we have the 3D data compilation and models. Um, and over there is, the, is a picture of the website. So that's on, on the SMI um, Northwest Mineral Province Deposit Atlas website. And so all of those documents and the data sets are, are available just to, to download uh, online. Um, and they're also on those, um, those USB drives that were the black ones sitting on the desks. Um, so, so that's it. I'll, I'll leave it there in terms of the, um, the talking. And, um, and now we can, we can crank up a, um, a, Wolf, a Walford Creek, um, the Walford Creek um, data set and, uh, and have a bit of a look at it and, um, and have a run through, through the data. So I'll, I'll give you a couple of minutes to, um, to, to anybody who has laptops or geoscience um, analyst. Um, you can open up those, those files that, that were on those uh, pen drives I passed around and we'll have a bit of a look through the, um, through the data sets. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. Hey, mm. wait, wait for the microphone. <laughs> So you've been looking in detail at that um, discovery history. Mm. It looks like up, up until the early 90s, a lot of mapping and then the mapping largely stopped and it was taken off by geophysics and geochemistry and detailed studies, yes. but, but yeah. not so much basic mapping. Looking at it now, would you say it's time to go back to some basic mapping aided by all of those techniques we've got available to us? Because there's an awful lot more, well, there's still an awful lot that needs to be mapped. Mm. And with all the technologies we've got available, we can map much better than they would have been able to map during these earlier mapping uh, periods. Yeah. So I, I suppose I'm making a plea here to Helen yes. that we should <laughs> really start considering starting mapping, serious mapping again. Yeah, yeah. And Would you agree, or do you think that's old fashioned? Well, I, I, I think there's there, there are two two aspects to it here. I guess what, what, one one is is degree of coverage. Okay, and we can, we can always be refining our our work. And and you know, I, I I can't see Helen might correct me here, but but I I can't see really too many of the surveys in Australia, for example, returning to your standard map sheet mapping, but I think now people are starting to focus, and and we heard um, we heard earlier today uh, Derek talking about trying to tackle individual problems, uh, or not problems, but individual areas where where there is is a part of interest. So I, I I totally agree with you. There's still a lot to be mapped. It's it's a matter of how much detail you're going to go down to, and and who's going who's going to fund it. Um, and the other part is I, I think is technologies. And, and I think pe people tend to say we don't need to map because we've got these technologies. But what I would like to see is, is the mapping style changing from, from broad scale mapping, let's map this map sheet, to these technologies have shown us that there is something interesting here and that's a problem to be solved and apply the mapping in, in, that, um, in that area. So, so I, I, I see technologies as perhaps focusing our mapping ra rather than subsuming it. And, and we also see that, sorry, Helen, I saw you picking up the microphone. We, we also see that in drill core, okay? And, and it, it possibly still is the days in some places that, that, that people go out and, and stand in the pad, stand in the core shed and, and they're specifically employed to log drill core and fill in fields in a database. And I think that's going as well now. So that, that those geologists uh, are now having a better use of their time because they will go in they will have more multi-element geochemistry. They'll have hyperspectral data with good core photo, photography, et cetera. And they'll be able to say, well, instead of filling in all those boxes in my drill sheet, I'm going to have that done by these technologies. And then I'm going to identify what are the interesting parts in that core that I really should be focusing on. 
So, so I, I see it as, as geologists now, I think, are going to have much more interesting work because they're going to have problems and they're not going to spend, spend their, their time doing rote, um, you know, mi mineral percentage calculations to put in, or not calculations, estimations to put into, into spreadsheets. So I, I think it's a much more focused, um, a focused um, geology logging of drill core, which is, I think is sort of an analogy, yeah. So, yeah. I can't resist doing a bit of an answer to that too. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I think there's a great, there's, there's a great possibility of, of, of finding a halo in exposed regions that hasn't been noticed. Um, so, so to actually understand and recognize a halo for mineralization that is either, you know, not outcropping because it's covered by a really thin veneer of, of cover or something like that in an area that's broadly exposed. Um, and that would be brought to light by analysis of all the data that we have combined with good geological mapping. I think there's a great opportunity there. Um, and, um, but, I, but I would also say, I wouldn't underestimate the, the, uh, um, the capability of prospectors, maybe not so much geologists, but prospectors to have found outcropping mineralization. If there was outcropping mineralization, I mean, you never want to say they would have found it, but they probably would have found most of it. But absolutely, there are things to be done in the outcropping regions. They're just not the things we did before. So going back and doing, uh, you know, another round of mapping like it's been done previously um, at, at, greater, at, at greater scale, I think there's a lot of new information to be gleaned, um, but it's got to be done with um, some sort of model in your head for what you're trying to find, because it's probably not going to be outcropping mineralization. But I think a lot of people are focusing on, on the sort of things we're focusing on, because if we can get it right, probably there's a greater opportunity in areas where there's cover. Nick had something. I'm going to, while Rick's walking around, I'm going to throw that over to the exploration companies in the room. If you were going to give the geological survey a job, would it be go out and remap sheets? Or would it be collect more data undercover? Or would it be mineral systems work? Well, I think mapping should also include uh, looking at drill core. So there's this, there's this feeling that mapping is just the surface. And we have this horrible problem that people don't enjoy enough spending time solving problems by looking at rocks. And we forget also that there's two, there's two aspects. There's the actual logging where you collect the data. And then there's the whole interpretation side, which is often coming back with the data you've got, whether it be people's logs or electronic. But you hear people like Dick Silito saying, no matter how many toys they threw at porphyries in South America, the last five were all discovered by people looking at the rocks and thinking because I don't think any system yet applies the knowledge that a geologist, a good geologist has to looking at a 3D set of data and encouraging people to sort of think about where the next one is. So I have a problem with the drill core being thrown out at the end of a project unless somebody's gone back. So that's an issue because the outcrop's always there. But when we can't fit it all in our, the GSQ core shed, we're actually losing the outcrop we're creating, if you see what I mean. Oh, yep, yep. No, I, I certainly agree with all that as well. Um, in answer to your question, Helen, yeah, I would like to see extra, um, if it, we're going to do data acquisition, I'd like to see it undercover. Um, that's where we can uh, make the most impact when you're talking about stratigraphic holes, when you're talking about we have entire mag complexes up in north, uh, north of Cloncurry and, and Ernest Henry that are 12 kilometers square but have two holes in them. Um, that, that's, that's clearly an area we can make an impact, especially if we do manage to break that barrier of, of the cost of, uh, of drilling and, and, you know, with a coal tube rig, that type of thing. Don't know if that'll actually be what actually does it, but if we can actually do a step change in costs, that's probably how we'll end up attacking it anyway. I do like mapping. I can't help it. I'm a traditionalist. Um, and there's still a lot to be done there from the point of view that uh, we certainly find areas that uh, 
we have a look at and we find greater detail. Sometimes the actual greatest issue is, is, is doing all that great work. And it's often associated with a master's or, or an honors program. And then actually getting it back to the, to the GSQ to effectively put it back into the system. That's probably where most industries, um, that interface is probably still failing. And from the point of view of, of uh, finding things that surface and it being dog's ball obvious, I think that's part of our problem. We can see it in those graphs, it isn't. But what we're missing still are the, the and, and Rick pointed out, is that we're, we're talking about the, the uh, when you're sitting in a halo and standing in a halo, we're still, there are cryptic vectoring, uh, uh, cryptic alterations that you can't even really probably even see. We're, we're noting that right now with our own, with our own internal research. And, you, and, and once you actually start to look at that and you, then you figure out how you're gonna apply it out in the field, that, that, that could actually be very, very powerful from a superficial mapping, taking the latest technology out into the field and then applying it that way. But I don't see that that's necessarily going to be um, the survey doing that. That is, uh, that is uh, uh, the, the froth of, of exploration advantage as you, as you develop those things in-house. I've, in, in a previous life, I've sold a property to someone who walked on to another corner of the property that we never mapped and found a porphyry copper. <laughs> My name is Rick Valente and I'm a schmuck. <laughs> All right. Um, why don't we kick off the the deposit atlas exercise? Has everybody got the the data on their laptops? Yeah. Are there any online questions, Matt? No. Okay. So I'm going to assume that everybody online has also managed to download the data set. And I'll hand back over to Paul. Okay, thanks, Helen. Um, all right, so what, um, what, what we have here is, uh, as soon as I can find the, uh, the right folder. Oh, here we go. Well, so if, if um, let me just share this, um, this screen. I will... Um, Here we are. Yeah, sorry, I'm not sure how to share the screen on this. Yeah, yeah. Share it already. Yeah, how do we swap? Um, All right, okay. If that's all right. So you want to get you want to get it going? Get get. Set. Oh, that's right. I can drag it onto the other screen, yeah, can't so I? Yeah. Have you have you quit from? I don't know. We've got to. Yeah, if, yeah, just go to the folder, oh, the folder underneath. I'm just going to quit from PowerPoint here. Yeah, okay. Uh, and then, which one? Walter That's Edison. it, yeah, yep, great. Oh, so we can start that and then drag it onto the other screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think good. so. Let's see. Let's see how it works. Okay, so so the um, geoscience analyst um, files. Fun, you're going to have to look at it over there. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, 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 fine, yeah. I don't have the red. Okay, I don't have the so it's over to the right. There we go. It can work? Yep, I think so. We'll just maximize it. Yeah. Mm. Uh, might have to turn this podium around. Or yeah, that's all right. Of... I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be right. Uh, yeah, look, so, so what, we, um, what, what we have is on, on those, on those um, Drives that you have, there should be a, um, a, f a folder called Walford uh, Exercise. Sorry, it's a bit, there we go. Uh, and essentially, what, what we've done here is put the, um, put the, the Walford Creek uh, information together. Um, so you can, you can arc that up if you want. Um, this should have the um, geological map on it. Um, I'll just move this. Okay. Um, is, is there anybody here, uh, has this, this up or, or sort of most people watching, I guess, um, there's one over there. Okay. Oh, good. So, so what, what, what I've done is, is, um, set, set this, um, this, this, uh, up, um, and 
I've, I've, this is the data. So we have regional geology, geophysics, geochem, and, and I've, I've sort of stepped it down the, down the way that you would, would partly run, run your exploration data sets and, and have access to those data sets. So, so that first, for example, you have your, um, your regional geology, which I'm sorry, this should have had the, um, the, uh, should have had the geology mapped onto it, but for some reason it has, um, it has not, uh, we'll put that up anyway there. Excuse me, one second. What, what, um, what we're doing is just, just mapping the, um, the geology onto that topography. Uh, sorry, it's a bit hard to see across the room there. Sorry? Oh, it must, must be something to do with this, this machine, I think. So anyway, this is the, um, so this is the, um, the geology you have there. Okay. And we'll put the legend on. Um, so this, um, this, is, this is up, up around the Walford Creek area. And I thought I would, um, would, would put it on so that you can, you can have, a, have a look at that, uh, at that geology. Okay. So this is the legend uh, going from, from old here up, up through, through the, um, so I'm finding it hard to see here, up, up through the, um, the, the old granites, the Tuala group, um, the Peters Creek volcanics, and then the Fickling. And then um, what's this one up here? The, um, anyway, I can't quite read that. Um, and up into your, your Mesozoic and Quaternary type rocks. Um, so, so that what's, what's happening here is, um, is so that's, that's the, the 2D geology that you've got. So we also have the, um, the 3D geology in there so that, um, sorry, I, I had a, um, a lot of exaggeration on that for the topography earlier. Um, so the, what, what we've done is take, take the data sets from the um, Northwest Queensland Mineral Exploration Province study um, from 2010. And in, in all of the, the digital atlases, we've, we've imported that data, which is, is your set of faults that you have through the area, and also the stratigraphy, which is set up into your, um, your super sequences, uh, your super basins, okay? So, so for example, you'll have your South, your South Nicholson Basin right up the top there. Um, then, then into your Isa, Isa, super, Isa, Isa super Basin, et cetera. And you can see, you see that in, in that data set, so for example, I'll, I'll, this, this is the um, Fish, Fish Creek Fault, Fish River Fault here, uh, and you can see that, that it's been down thrown to the, the south. So up, uh, you're up on the Murphy Ridge up here to the north, um, and then, then your Isa, Isa group is, is down thrown along with the rest of your stratigraphy uh, down, to, down to the south here, okay? So, so we, have, we have the 2D geology and the 3D geology. Um, so so if, you, if you go back and you look at, um, you know, we were talking earlier about the copper cobalt deposits, the carbonate hosted copper cobalt deposits, and, um, and Western Mining came up to this area looking for essentially Isa type um, to ro rocks to find, find um, lead zinc and deposits. Uh, so, so if you have a look through that, um, through, I'm not sure if you can see that, but basically this, this is your stratigraphy. So, so you have a look up through there and say, well, where, where, are, where are the carbonates in that, that stratigraphy? And, 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 and if you do that in this case, you basically then come up to the, up to the Fickling group, which, which is, I'll, I'll let you know now. So this is, is essentially where the Walford Creek um, deposit sits in through here. Um, so, so looking, looking for that, um, that, that stratigraphy, you then are essentially, this is the Fish River Fault. So, so you're down to the south of that where your stratigraphy is down thrown. And, and so you're finding your fickling group uh, down in here. So, so this was uh, when Western Mining went into this area. That there were a couple of, well, I'm, I'm not a mind reader, but from what, what I read of the old literature and, and exploration reports, they, they, there were a couple of things that attracted them here. One, one was, was the major fault. Uh, the second was was the right type of um, rock sequence, and the third was the presence along along strike along the Fish um, Fish Creek Fault Fish River Fault of um, mineral occurrences, lead zinc um, mineral occurrences. So so that was basically what uh, what what took them in here. So so if you, if you if you look at that stratigraphy, then you're going you're going from the older uh, uh, older older granites and the Peter Creek um, volcanics, which which include mafic rocks up to the north here. And, and we were talking earlier about cobalt deposits and, and their relationship with, with ultramafic and or mafic piles. And, and uh, you know, you, you wonder if, if that cobalt um, mineralisation we see at Walford Creek is, is not somehow related to this large mafic pile up, up here to the north. 
Um, so, so that's the um, so that's the the geology, and then you uh, then you can step through to the um, geophysics. So the regional geophysics is is the next thing we'll um, we'll have a look at. Um, I'll just try and expand that. There we go. So, so this this is this is the uh, the gravity data. These are the standard data sets we put in all, all the atlases. Um, and then, um, for example, the um, the magnetic data. So, what what you can see in the magnetic data here is this this is the the older rocks, so the Murphy Murphy Bridge, Murphy Inlier, um, and and then this is the the Fish River Fault along to the south here, and the, and then you get into the Fickling Fickling and and other sequences here to the south. Um, so, so this zone along here was was essentially the, um, the, the 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 fault zone that was being being targeted. So, so we've we've put that regional geophysical data in there, and then there's um, there was a great data set thrown, flown in 1998. It was the um, the Tempest um, data set, and it, it was flown, I think, by uh, maybe CSIRO, and they um, it was was flown by CSIRO and processed by uh, GA, I think. Uh, as a bit of a test case, and and this is the shells. I think it's the the hundred milli um, per metre conductivity shell, and so they they really started to map out um, the airborne EM uh, was mapping out the the, the massive pyrite layers within the, within the Fickling Fickling group. Um, it's now this is airborne EM. It was interesting, but but WMC before when they first went into the area actually ran ground EM over. Um, I'm not sure what it was, whether it was fixed loop or moving loop, but they ran ground EM over that fault zone, and they were able to to map these these massive pyrite layers as long as they were above 200 meters depth. And then there there are various faults that you might have seen in the magnetic data that that are almost orthogonal to the Fish River Fault that um, down down throw this massive pyrite layer. So as soon as it got below about about 100, about 200 metres, they couldn't map it anymore. And even below about 100 metres, it was difficult to, to delineate. Um, so that was the ground EM. But but this this is actually a map of the. Um, we might even have the um, the grid in here as well. So you can see there's there's the grid of the Tempest airborne EM data. So up up to the north. Uh, on the on the um, St Peter's Creek volcanics, uh, the Peter's Creek volcanics, etc. You're, you're very flat um, e EM response, but as soon as you get over the Fickling group with your your carbonaceous rocks and massive pyrite layers, you start to see the um, see the conductivity come in. So so that's the regional uh, geophysics. So that that was the targeting mechanism that they used to basically come along this fault and and uh, find the the conductive uh, patches. So they're the um, regional data sets. There's also the regional um, geochemistry that we have in there as well. Um, so that when you, um, that's, that's the stream sediment um, data, which, um, oh, sorry, it's a bit difficult here on the other screen. Um, so there's a lot of stream sediment data. You, you, can, you can see that there's, um, um, this is, uh, is coloured by, if we have a look at here, we can see that it's, oh, it's coloured by copper. Okay, so you, you can see particularly where you have these mafic units of the of the Peter, Peter Creek volcanics, you, you're getting copper anomalism, and then some of it is shedding down onto the um, on, onto around the Fish, Fish River Fault zone. Uh, so that's a bit of an example of the sort of data sets that we, we have in there. Um, so they're, they're the regional um, data sets. Um, now, what um, what Aeon Aeon metals were were um, were, were helpful enough and, and generous enough to give us plenty of data. So that what, what we have is the, um, is the drilling from that area. So you may be able to see those drill holes in there. Okay. And, um, and let's have a look at this, this section. Um, and, and what is plotted here is from the drilling um, is, I'll just close this up a little bit. So, so from the drilling, we're now looking at the bedding, okay, the Walford bedding. So the, 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 what you can see is the, I'll turn off a couple of these uh, layers of the geophysics, et cetera. Okay. Um, so what, you, what, you, what you're seeing there is, I'll put the, um, I'll put the, uh, the uh, Fish River Fault on, which is in, in the geology here, if you have that. Um, deposit surfaces. So we'll put the um, Fish River Fault on. Okay, so you, you can see that this this drilling has gone just into into the um, in, into the, the hanging wall of the Fish River Fault, and um, and then you look look at the bedding, and you can see that yeah, this this is where the bedding is coming into the into the Fish 
fish river fault. So I, I guess this is, is not so much to see something right now, but it's to, to give you an idea of the sort of data sets that, that are in, the, um, in these, these atlases. Um, now, what, what we've also done is put in the, um, the high resolution core photos so that um, we'll pull them up. And what I thought um, on, that, on those um, hard drives, there was a, a single page PDF that had the lithostratigraphy from the, the Walford Creek deposit. So I thought if, if, you can, um, if you can bring that up, what we'll do is, and it's, a, it's really nice to have a look, is we'll, we'll drag up the core photo. So I'll click core photos here. It'll take a little while to, to load because they're, they're so um, enormous. But um, we, we can have a bit of a look down those drill holes and actually see where the, um, where, where the lithostratigraphy starts and stops, uh, the different units, okay? So I'll, I'll pull this up, okay? There we go. So, so this is this is the um, the, the stratigraphic um, column through through the, the Walford deposit. So that you, you have the Walford um, the um, Walford dolomite on the bottom, and then you pass up through sort of a carbonaceous dolomite, calcareous dominate, carbonaceous dolomite, and then the mineralization is present in two two lenses. They call it PY one at the bottom, which is a is a pyritic lens, and then there's a green siltstone in the middle, and you can see see what that looks like. And then there is um, pyrite one, which is, is the upper pyrite lens with mineralization in it. And then you go, you go further up sequence through the siltstone and, and up to the unconformity, uh, I think above the upper Mount Les siltstone. Um, so this is, this is what those rocks look like, the pyritic siltstone there and there, and then the, um, the green, green siltstone in the middle. Um, so let's see if those core photos have come up yet. Okay, so there we are. If you hold C and click, it will center around that, that um, what you've clicked on, hopefully. Okay, so there we go. You've got the, um, you've got the core photos in there. I'll turn, off, I'll turn off the geology so we don't have the Fish River fault in the way there. Okay, and then, oh, well, it looks like maybe I've even picked the, the contact here. So, so coming down the hole, you, you can see that this is, this is the green siltstones here. And this, this, this may be the change from green into the pyrite up, up above, okay? And so according to that um, lithostrat column, you should then go down and you'll, you'll come back into the, next, um, into the next pyritic layer. So I'll just give you, um, just give you a, a couple of minutes, five minutes, to, to have a bit of a look through the, the Geoscience Analyst um, project and, and uh, you, you can have a bit of a look at that core and, and, and start, to, start to have a look down the, the drill core. And it's, I know... It's, it's interesting, Nick, you're talking about your, your drill core is basically mapping just in, 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 in one vertical or near vertical line. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. You, you, can, you can even get so much if, if you have a look at these core photos. And it's, it's like when you get a new hole and you do your first pass down the core and, and roughly break up the, um, break, break up the, um, the stratigraphy. Um, so I'll give you a couple of minutes, those who have it open, and you, can, uh, and you can have a bit of a look down that drill hole and just, just have a look and see... see where, where you can see the green siltstone and where are the pyritic layers and you can have a bit of a stab at where the grade might be, for example. And then, um, and then once we've done that, in a couple of minutes, we'll pull up the actual assays and the geological logging and see, um, see sort of how, how close we were. And it gives me an excuse to have a quick drink of water. Mm. <laughs> good, good to see somebody's got it up there. Sorry? Oh, that's right. It doesn't matter if everybody hears what I'm saying to you.
There's. Oh, that's it. You have it. Is that it? Yeah. Where is? I can't see those. Yeah, over on the left, there should be something that says okay. drilling. I couldn't see it before. Yeah, yeah so that, that'll have the core photos and everything in it. There you go, yeah. So, yeah, see, so you'll need to check the drilling on and it should um, hopefully come on. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a lot of core cool photos, so it will take a minute just to speak fast. Yes, yeah. Okay, we, we have a lot, um, a lot of things to, to get on to next. Rick's going to show us some um, Euclidean material. So, so we'll just push on with this. Um, so basically, this, this is, the, um, is the core. And um, what, what um, we've been provided, for example, is the um, geolo simple, simplified geological log. So you'll see down these drill holes, um, if I click on this, you'll see that it's, it's uh, well, it's the mineralised one unit. So that's that's the up, probably the upper pyrite layer. I think green is probably the um, is the green siltstone, and then you come down underneath into the um, the, the second mineralised unit. So that if, if we we look in there, we should um, see that that rock change. Okay, so up up to the top, you're in, in that greenish siltstone, and then as you go down, you get into the pyrite layer. And I think. I don't know if it's this hole, but some of them actually go through the Fish River Fault and down into the um, St. Peter's Volcanics in the basement. So it certainly looks like you're down, down around the, the fault material here. It's down at the bottom of the hole. Okay. So that, that was just, just to sort of show you the sort of data that's sitting in these, um, in these, these projects. And so, so if you go to the SMI website, um, this, these geoscience analyst projects are there for all, all 20 two chapters, okay? So there's a lot of data from a lot of different deposits. So if you're ever interested in, in any type of deposit, um, let, let alone a, a specific deposit, but any deposit style, it's really worthwhile to go, go and have a bit of a look and you can actually have a good look at, at, at what the rocks look like, the, the structural architecture around the area and what the geology is like and, and the various other data sets, you know, the geochemistry, et cetera, that's sitting there. So... Um, Oh, okay. I'm just yep. Yeah, excellent. Um, so, so that's 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 just a quick um, quick whip through that. So I'll um, I'll leave that exercise there. So you can take or take all that data or download it, and um, you can just install Geoscience Analyst on your machine. Um, it's it's free. Uh, it's done by the people who make uh, Mora Geoscience, who are involved with GoCAD. So it's, so it's a pretty nice product. You can access uh, all that that data. Um, which is a nice segue onto what um, Rick's going to talk about. Um, sometimes you may not, may not feel like you want to download software onto your computer and open, open a file up after you've downloaded it, et cetera, but um, Rick can tell you about some work that he's been doing with uh, Euclidean to make it much more accessible. Mm. There you go, Rick. Thank you. Yeah, so I think we've, we've, got, uh, we've got about 15 minutes left, so I'm not going to... They're, 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 we've, we've handed out this, this software, but I'm probably not going to make it an exercise. I'm just going to maybe show you what, what you can, um, you know, what you can do to have a play with it. Um, I better... oh. Oops, I keep going in the wrong direction here. Save changes? No. Right. Okay. And I'm going to go to... So... Uh, um, I just want to show really quickly. So this is a um, one of the things that um, one of the things that uh, um, that, that characterizes the um, um, geoscience analyst software is you know as as uh, Paul said we've got all these compilations of different deposits multiple regional models as well, so all the seismic, um, the various 3D models, a whole bunch of stuff that's been all compiled into, into Geoscience Analyst, and it's fantastic. It's all available in downloadable zip files. The software is free. Um, 
if you look at Walford Creek, you load up Walford Creek, you look, you load up all the data and that pretty much maxes out your computer if you've got a good computer. Um, and then if you want to look at another deposit, you quit from that one and you open up another one. Um, and so the challenge is that, that it, you have to download the data. The challenge is that it's, you have to have a pretty grunty computer. Um, and if you, if you update the data, if the people compiling the data update it, then you have to go and download the next version of the data and that sort of thing. So that's all I was going to say there. Um, we'd been working as we had bought a, a hologram table from this group called Euclidean. And they, they also had this other piece of software that's a free piece of software called UD stream. And, um, and we sort of felt like that'd be a good, and they felt like that as well, that'd be a good thing to visualize geological data with it. So they've been, you know, they've been working on, we, we've been working together to try to make it able to visualize geological data. And I guess I'll try and just show you why. Um, why we think that's an interesting thing to do. One of the, um, I'm just going to take a second to log in here. I'm going to run into the same problem Paul ran into here. So, um, just, Oh, wow. Um, it's going to work if I come around like this. You don't mind looking at my, yeah, that's better. Yes, the software is on those things. So you can, what's that? It's, there's, yeah, there should be a Windows version as well. So I'm just going to open this project. They've actually got an online. We've, we've taken bits of the Mount Isa Atlas and, and loaded it onto this software. And what these guys did, the reason we bought the hologram table from them was that they had the entire Gold Coast loaded up. It was uh, when, we, when they loaded up the data and the guy who was showing it to us was, had it loaded on a, a little pink MacBook Air and he was connecting over the slow guest internet connection at UQ, and he was flying real time through a picture of the Gold Coast. And I thought, well, that seems like an interesting thing because of the problems that we have with, with large amounts of, of data. So this is just a, like a little progress report of trying to do the same thing with geological data. So what we've got here is the, the, um, the uh, um, so so in the background is a tiled image of the of the magnetics, um, at relatively high resolution. So it includes the latest stitch and and so on. Um, then the, the the strips you can see are the are the compilation that I showed last time we were here in Mount Isa of all the seismic interpretations for the Mount, uh, that were available at that time for the Mount Isa region. Um, and then the colored strips here are the exploring for the future. Um, airborne EM. So all the airborne EMs in there as well, if you zoom in close enough. Um, and, and then coming up, and it takes a little while to load up because this, this is not on my computer. This is actually all this data sitting on the Amazon web server. So we're, I'm, I'm loading up all this data and it's uh, you know gigabytes and gigabytes of data. But I'm loading it all up over the wireless. Um, and I don't know if this is there yet, but you can, with this sort of system, because they've got a clever way to store data, you can even go as far as, that looks a little bit funny, but, but loading up the, the drill core as well. Um, so there's the, the drill core for, you know, uh, the drill core that we have for Ernest Henry. Um, and if you go back, if we zoom out a little bit, Oh yeah, that's just, that's gone a bit weird, sorry. Um, the magnetotellurics are in there as well. Can't see them very well on this, but the, the I'm not sure why that's not showing too well. It's, it's, it's a work in progress, right? But the, um, um, so the magnetotellurics are, are in there, but, but the, other, the other thing about this is that you can, what we're looking at now is the, is the 3D model as well for the, 
that that was put together for the Northwest Queensland, the NWQ MEP, so that that compilation that came out in 2010. So the 3D model for there is all in there. Um, and, you know, the one, the, there's a bunch of data for, for Cannington. So, so um, if we move to, there's, uh, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's some of the sections and then, then over here we've got, I, I, I should turn some of it off. That'll make it easier to see it. But the, you know, we've got um, images of the various geophysical data. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're, it's a gaming company, right? So they, they, what they've done is they've come up with a clever way to, to, to store all this data so that it's, so that it's easily accessible. Um, and, you know, same thing for, so for Osborne, for example, there, well, there's, here's a drill hole from, from Osborne. And in this case, what we've got as well is the, is the Tima imagery. So, uh, um, yeah, so it's, it's uh, what, I guess what the vision here is that, and I won't, I won't spend, I'm, I've pretty much used up my time now. So, um, so we've got, you know, we've got drill core and is basically to have, rather than having 24 different atlases and, and all those regional compilations um, in separate files that you have to download and do all that stuff with, is to have them all available online. And, and if someone, if the GSQ or whoever decides to add more data to it, or, you know, I think we talked before about people being able to add data themselves or submit it to add it to a model like this, that we've got like a common model for the whole Northwest Mineral Province that's got everything in it. If it's got, if there's new mapping, if a student has gone out and, and remapped an area, then it, you could throw in a, a map from that area relatively easily. Um, and, and essentially the amount of data that you could put into this system and access as long as you've got a you know, reasonable connection is unlimited. I've literally seen like a 400 terabyte file being loaded up and, and, it, and it works. So, so we're, it's not a sort of super major project for us. We don't have a commercial arrangement with these guys. It's more just trying to think about the next phase of, of, of work to try to make all this data available in a seamless and, and, and usable way. Um, there's a there's a version as well that they're working on that 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 we actually have. They've given me the special software for it where it can, but I'm not going to load it up now. We've run out of time. Where you can actually visualize and plot values in in drill holes. Um, they're improving the polygons because they're a little bit they're a little bit messy right now. But it's uh, it's just showing I think what you know that the sort of next phase that we'd like to to take this to. Uh, but the thing that I wanted to, to show you, so you've got the, you've got the software there. What they've also done, um, I've just got to load up the, so, so that the, in order to, sorry, i just pull this across. In order to, when you, if you, if you download that data and, and start it up, and start up Euclidean or start up UD stream, it'll ask you for a username and password. They've set up a whole bunch of dummy usernames and passwords so that, um, you know, I didn't think it was appropriate for us to give them everybody's email address in a, and in, in fact, I knew it wasn't appropriate. So I said, we can't do that. Um, so that what I'm showing here is just a, just a little picture of the room. Um, and, and this, this SMI one, SMI two, SMI three, SMI four, SMI five. So, so this is that that uh, table over there. Um, this one over here is that table over there. This is going to mean a lot to you people online. I know that. Um, and and um, and so people who are in the room, these are all the different logins, and it, they're all the same password: Mount Isa one two three um, exclamation mark. So you would just put. Um, Matt would put in SMI1 at uq.com and um, um, Matt over there would put in SMI29 at, at uq.com. Um, and Martin, you'd be 30, I think, but the, uh, 
Um, the other thing is, if you don't want to download any software, you can actually, it's a little bit slower, but you can just run the whole thing on a web page. So this is a bit slower. You'll see in a second, this is not going to go that, that fast. But um, this is basically accessing that same, that same data without installing any software on your computer at all. Um, and uh, the only thing is you can see it's, it's, uh, it has to think about things a little bit more, but uh, there we go. And they've changed the, uh, where's, I've lost my mouse now. Can you see him? Oh, there it is. So there's the, so this is, there is no software on, this is just running off the web page. Um, it doesn't have, the, the, the version that they did here doesn't have the, um, doesn't have the, uh, uh, the tiled map that I put together with the mag. Um, and we just got to make the surface opaque, but you can still see that you got all the seismic there and, and at eventually we'll have the, Another drill core is there, so we'll go back, move to the Ernest Henry drill core. So that's running over the wireless, basically. Boom. I'm getting lost now, and I can't. Oh yeah, there's the, there's the drill holes. Oh, that's not drill holes. That's sorry. Anyway, yeah, um, <laughs> it's it's very hard to to navigate from this from this angle. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Where we got a hologram table. So anyway, so that's that's the other thing. That's probably all I wanted to show at this stage. But if you want to have a play with that, and it's probably more fun to have a play with it than watch somebody else somebody else have a play with it. There's there's the. There's the details for getting on. It doesn't work with Safari, by the way, because I just tried it on my Mac and I had to install Chrome before it would work. So we've only got five minutes left before um, before uh, afternoon tea. So if anyone has any questions or comments or anything, then, then um, I'll turn the mic on. Yeah. Stunned silence. Well, I liked it. <laughs> I think it's amazing. I think we had one question for you guys as well, which is uh, clearly it's it's a little bit, um, you know, it's got a little bit of work to do, a little bit of tidying up around the edges, but. Our question is, what, what would you like to see implemented in that environment? Um, we, we can put the whole of Queensland geology in here. The, the data is infinite. So the, the, the development question then is, what do we want to do with it? Um, and it's not really the sort of package which should become an analytical package. It's always going to be a visualization thing. Um, but we'd, we'd love your feedback. <laughs> That's not a bad suggestion, I don't think. Yeah, the suggestion was for people online, a robot, so you can actually tell it where you want to go rather than having to, to grapple around. We could build a virtual geo and they could go mapping. <laughs> it, it, it actually works with, um, don't laugh, it works with a um, um, PlayStation or a Xbox 360 thing. Yeah, yeah. I should have brought my... My son's yeah. Xbox 360 thing. It would have would have been made for a better. Yeah, M Mick Cook here was was, you know, asking, can it go into the augmented reality world? And at the moment, it's it's actually on that web browser and as software on your laptop. But the idea is that you you know we we want to be able to link it into the hologram table or into virtual VR goggles, so you can do things collaborative research, you know, with a group of people all looking at the same data.
I guess something on that, um, Euclidean is built on the same engine that is used for gaming. So it's basically, it's, it's a gaming system that they've moved into using for other applications. So I imagine it's ready to go into an AR system um, with those sort of things. There's some question as well from, from Mike Whitbread asking if you can explore, if you can export data from Euclidean, um, which you probably could potentially, because it is that game system of building a, a cube of, uh, of data visualization. Uh, yeah, I, that's a great question, Mike. Um, I think one vision that Rick and I have is that this could be an environment where you, you could search for data and then once you found it, you could export it. it. That ability isn't yet there, but it's not hard for them to, yeah. to implement if we work with them. That's Yeah, we've been talking to them about, actually they suggested this, that all of the, all of the you know, the, the, data is for, um, the, the data is stored in a proprietary format, but the, the project that throws all this stuff together is a JSON file, which is just a, it's just a text file. And the headers of all these of all these data sets can include a link to the to the GSQ data portal. Yeah, I was just about to say everything that we're building at the moment in the open data portal is based on JSON as well, as well as having persistent identifiers for every single data set. So if you had metadata in the JSON that could link to persistent identifiers, then we can build, you know, that system could be built anytime. So that would be cool. I'd like to see it. Okay, is that it for online questions? Okay. Um, one thing that might be useful would be um, drill holes. All the drill holes with metadata, even if they don't have, um, you know, the, the uh, Imago style um, photography, but so we can go and find them um, and, and approach people about that. Another comment, coming back to the, what do we, what do we want to see? So what data can we collect? Something might be interesting. So you know, could this conversation about mapping. So we're always trying to make a map. You know, it's, we're just trying to make it potentially undercover. Things that would really help support that would be petrophysical data. So we can then push and forward model um, potential field data undercover. One of our other projects, which hasn't been presented on uh, this workshop that uh, um, Jim Austin at CSIRO has been working on with us is collecting a lot of petrophysical data amongst other things in, um, in selected drill holes for key deposits. So it's definitely on our radar. Yeah, and the, and the atlases have, have petrophysical data. Not all of them, but we tried to put petrophysical data into them. And I guess the other thing to say is that the... Um, the, the version, there's an experimental version that I didn't get, I ran out of time to show today that, that actually plots drill hole data. And the aim there is, is you know, eventually it's, I think it's limited to about 32 different characteristics that you can put in it, but they're already working on getting it up to a, you know, a number bigger than any number you'd care to do that could include metadata and, and links to, you know, with the core, for example, what, what you, that's core from, from high logger. So you probably want to, be able to move your mouse along that picture of the core and actually access the spectral data from from high logger that's i mean the whole aim of this is to make to make playing with all this data into a geology exercise not a software exercise which it still kind of is now so well thanks hal yes i was just going to say one one more thing I, i've never used the web interface before and just to clarify to anybody just write down that um that link address there and when you get back to your computer just enter it it's as simple as that there's you don't need the password or anything for the web web browser you go straight into it yep yeah it doesn't ask you for a password so.